Scorched Earth is a military strategy used by various powers throughout history. What it involves is the destruction of assets as one retreats, giving up the land to an invading force whilst denying them any resources and infrastructure that may have originally been found in that area. This forces the invading group to set up supply lines, which of course drains power and resources. Not to mention, it means you can target said lines. Russia stands out as a prolific user of the strategy. They utilise it during the 1708 Swedish invasion, the 1812 Napoleonic invasion, and of course the Nazi invasion during the Second World War. In a stretched out conflict, scorched earth is often an effective strategy. Not simply because it denies your perceived opponent resources, but because of its psychological effect. To spend years of blood, sweat and tears fighting for ground which offers nothing can have a crippingly demoralising effect. And this element of said strategy can be used in other forms of conflict outside of the most obvious being war. Social justice is often an attritious affair in which two fronts do everything they can to move social progress in opposite directions. I was 18 years of age when the UK passed the Marriage Act of 2013. I was in my second year of college, part of my first LGBT plus support group, and we were watching things with great intensity. But one of the things I remember seeing as time went on was how many of the voices who'd fought against marriage equality on the basis that it defiled the so-called sanctity of marriage began switching tact. They began to argue that marriage as an institution was morally wrong. Now I need to be absolutely clear here. There are people out there who, in all good faith, view marriage to be wrong. They view it to be an outdated institution that offers a privileged position to a specific social relationship. And whilst I disagree with them, I don't want to misconstrue said people as homophobic bigots. They're not. But there's a difference between people who have genuinely reached the conclusion that marriage is bad, and those who simply say it as a last-ditch attempt to deny same-gender couples access to said institution. I just want to make that as clear as possible, as it's an important distinction for later. The people who spent years arguing that same-gender marriage would destroy the sanctity of marriage, only to switch to marriage being inherently evil, were clearly only saying that as a means to stop marriage equality. Or at least a major step towards marriage equality since there are still issues with the current system in place, specifically for trans and disabled individuals, not to mention individuals marrying citizens of other nations. Now of course this failed. Marriage as an institution was not abolished in UK society, same gender couples were given the right to marry under certain circumstances, and in general it has become part of British society. But let's just think about an alternative timeline in which that had happened. Marriage equality had been on the books for decades. For example, the Civil Partnership Act of 2004 was an attempt to stall that by giving same gender couples an equal but separate institution, which by the way, wasn't equal in many regards, just to be clear on that. So there had been countless protests over the issue whilst many LGB people saw the absence of marriage equality as a sign of how devalued they were, that they were second class citizens. Make no mistake, Whilst not directly, people have died indirectly as a result of being denied the right to equal representation under the law. So imagine all of that has still happened. And just as they were on the cusp of winning, they had the rug pulled out from under them. That the government had done away with marriage altogether. Could you imagine how soul crushing that would be? How insulting that would be to everyone who died indirectly by the government's legal discrimination against same-gender couples. Even though straight people would also lose out in that equation, this wouldn't be a loss at the end of decades of suffering and toil. That's the key difference here. Straight people would have lost something they'd never earned. Gay and bisexual people would have been denied that right that they'd bled for. It's a calculated move which seeks to do as little damage to those in power, whilst doing as much damage as possible to the marginalised. And its impact on all future social justice would have been significant. The drop in morale as marginalised people question why they should keep fighting for science if those in power will destroy it before they can get there would have resulted in many people abandoning the fight. After all, if there's nothing to be gained, 
I may as well spend my time making the best of what I currently have. It destroys the very hope of a better tomorrow. So should we do away with gender in sports? It's a question I've been receiving from the very moment I posted my response video to Stephen Woodford, better known by his YouTube handle, Rationality Rules, on the subject of trans athletes. And whilst at first I responded to these questions in good faith, eventually I had to start removing them since they took up a disproportionate amount of the comments and I was tired of responding to the same question over and over again. Don't worry, you weren't blocked. I just thought it would be better to go ahead and address this question in a future video. So, I hope you can understand that. Now, whilst many people asked this question, very often the way they asked it differed. I got a general sense that there were three groups. Those who were generally curious about my opinions, and those who were trying to use said questions as a means to attack me, and those I couldn't fit into either group. Very interestingly, Stephen Woodford recently came out and stated the following on Twitter. Quote, Of course, just as I support trans men competing in all men's categories, poorly named, women who have not experienced male puberty competing in all women's sport, also poorly named, and trans women who have experienced male puberty competing in long distance running, end quote. He later go on to add in a further tweet that, quote, To further clarify, I think that we must rename our categories according to what they're actually based on. It's not right to have a women's category and yet say to some trans women, who are women, that they can't compete within it. It should be renamed. End quote. Of course, this assumes that Woodford has justification for excluding some trans women from women's sport. He doesn't. Something I've rather effectively shown with evidence by this point. All Woodford does have is his personal opinion and several studies he knowingly lied about in relation to their contents. Also, he keeps using the dog whistle of male puberty. That's not fooling anyone. So what is Woodford actually setting about doing here? Well, now that he's been thoroughly demonstrated to have no justification for his transphobic position on the matter, Woodford is setting out to utilise the same scorched earth approach to the topic of trans people in sports as seen previously with marriage equality. He knows that his game is up, that his invalid assertions can't stand forever and that trans women are going to become part of women's sports eventually. The consensus is entirely against him. So what's there left to do? Well, he can pretend like the very system of sports is wrong in the existence of gendered categories. Which again, just like the prospect of marriage, there are people who generally hold the belief that gender sports is a bad thing. And I'm really happy to have a conversation with you about that since I do have my doubts about the way that sports is currently handled. But I can also see through the transparent bullshit that people such as Woodford and those who approach me the question in a hostile manner are utilising. Pretty much they're trying to change the game we've been playing up till now which has them defending why they believe a group of women should be excluded from women's sports to something entirely different. Now, unlike marriage, Woodford wants to keep the two-category system. He just wants to change the words associated with those categories in a manner that won't impact cis people, but considering the effort put in by trans people, will be cripplingly demoralising. Woodford is not setting out to improve sport. He's setting out to maximise the amount of harm he can cause trans people. That's his one and only goal with this act. Something which should remove any lingering doubt one may have had as to his transphobic nature just in case his attempts to get the attention of fellow transphobe Joe Rogan wasn't enough. Because when Woodford set out to make statements such as these... And I'm convinced that unless quickly rectified, this will kill women's sport. I don't want to see the day when women's athletics is dominated by Y chromosomes, but without a change in policy, that is precisely what's going to happen. He didn't seem to believe gender sports was a problem. It only became a problem after he'd fairly lost his fight to strip trans women of the numerous human rights which are violated when one excludes trans women from women's sports. For those not aware of the rights that action would violate, they include the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to sexual and reproductive health, the right to work and to the enjoyment of just and favourable conditions of work, 
the right to privacy, the right to freedom from torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and harmful practices, and full respect for the dignity, bodily integrity and bodily autonomy of the person. Just a quick note, this list comes from the United Nations Human Rights Council report discussing the rights violated when an intersex cis women such as Casta Semenya are excluded from women's sport. I use said list since it can't be claimed to be charged with the trans agenda, and yet intersex cis women and trans women face much the same body policing and forced medicalization. Another difference in all this is that unlike the earlier marriage example, there's no cost involved for Woodford. He has nothing riding on this at all. Outside of his desire to hurt trans women, regardless of how he's also hurting cis women, intersex cis women, cis women of colour, and lesbian cis women in particular, in the process. So to fix my opening analogy, it's less like the Russians setting fire to their own farmland as they retreat, and more like the British denial policy in the Second World War. But none of this of course gets over the main flaw of my analogy, which is of course the fact that in spite of Woodford's claims, Trans women are not some invading force taking over women's sports. Cis women's lies are also not his to deem expendable. He, as with those making this argument in bad faith, are merely looking for some way to scratch their bigoted itch, a way to hurt trans people and avoid being called out on it. But with that made clear, how does this relate to the question itself? Surely people's reasons for making this proposition are irrelevant to the proposal itself. Well, not always. When perception becomes part of the issue, when, how, and why we do something can be relevant. As already noted, there are consequences for those who have struggled to gain the same protections that those in power have benefited from extensively if said benefits are suddenly withdrawn. But there's also optics at play here. If Wood forgot his renaming of what have traditionally been called men's and women's sports, the people alive now aren't going to forget what these divisions were originally called. No matter what you call these groups, people are still going to see trans women's exclusion from whichever category was originally women's sports as evidence that trans women are not real women. Meanwhile, if you get rid of the whole idea of gender sports, how will that look? Sure, trans women will be allowed to play with other women, which is great. But to an outsider, it will look like the only way we could achieve this is to get a gender sports, rather than recognize trans women as a the gender they are. Once more reinforcing the idea that trans women are not real women. Let's also not forget the real danger here and how trans people would likely take the blame for any of the problems that emerge as a result of said action whether or not said trans people supported the move to abolish gender sports. It would certainly offer feminism appropriators a new battle cry to rally behind, increasing the abuse trans people suffer as a result. And there are genuine reasons to keep the sport segregated for the moment. Rape culture, a social phenomenon, is still very much prevalent in society today. Many cis men still hold a lot of toxic ideas surrounding masculinity that I can't just ignore then we have to consider the differences in sponsorship and sponsorship preferences. Would cis men push women out of sport, not because of advantage in performance, but because currently, men's sports is seen as more important than women's sports, therefore, male athletes will receive preferential treatment in genderless sports. Now you might say that the same could be said about trans women. Except, there's a lot of social hostility towards trans women that doesn't exist with cis men. And as women, they have as much right to sponsorships as other women. Note that these are not arguments to indefinitely suspend the idea. I think it has a lot of potential, but I don't see a benefit right now that surpasses all of these issues. So, I've come up with a potentially third solution to consider. First off the bat, keep gender sports whilst allowing trans women to compete as women and trans men to compete as men. That's important since it separates this current trans debate from the next stage. Introducing mixed gender sports. Note this is very different to the proposal to create an open category in which trans women could compete, since said proposal always comes with the exclusion of trans women from women's sport, even though they have no basis for that exclusion. The way I'm presenting is an option created after we've accepted trans women are women and trans men are men to see whether athletes are interested. And in fact, 
There are sports already doing this. There are mixed gender martial arts, for example. This would also allow us to test the water for a potential third phase, hopefully by which point the issues mentioned prior have been mostly resolved, in which we can start dismantling the gender categories altogether. I see this as a way to secure trans people their rights and offer active representation in gender sports, to test mixed sports without risking what we currently have, and to give us time to tackle various issues already mentioned, or ones which may become apparent over time. Also, it hopefully do away with this bullshit notion that your average Joe can stand up to a professional women's athlete, as one in eight men apparently believe. Or we could just test things and find out that no, gender sports is still very much necessary. In which case, trans women still maintain the right to compete as women, and vice versa for trans men. Beyond that, there are some really interesting avenues to possibly pursue, but it's all theoretical. But I hope this explained my position on that somewhat. It's not exactly been a detailed breakdown, but I hope you can sort of get why. I'm a little busy with helping efforts to secure trans people their human rights and allowing them to compete in the sport aligning with their gender. From hence on, I'll likely respond any time I receive this question with this video. Feel free to do the same if you come across it, because currently I see it as a distraction, sometimes deliberate and malicious, other times genuine and accidental, and that's why I'm sharing my thoughts publicly. As always, please check out our other videos, you can also support Essence for Thought via Patreon, and in doing so help us become ad-free. We'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone who's given to the channel, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, McGay, Amit Devojny, Erica Ann James, Daniel Martinez, Sam Braxton, Caitlin Smith, Atlas Five, Jennifer Hiller, and Aidan Desmeres. And for myself and Adita, take care now.